Hello everybody, it's Sam, Vault Boy Hunter with Magic Gathering Strat. Um, today I am interviewing Edmund McMillan. Um, you may know Edmund from being the designer of games such as The Binding of Isaac, um, of Super Meat Boy. Um, he also has a blog of personal stuff, which is mostly Isaac fan art, which I find all just amazing for the most part, um, on Ed Mc edmundm.com and of course you can all follow him on Twitter um, where people routinely spam his feed with how many hours they've played Isaac like on Saturday and that was insane. Some people have dedicated their life to your video game sir. Yeah people like there, there are more than a few people who have made a considerable living off of playing my game which is pretty cool. Yeah, no, um, I actually watch uh, Biznap on YouTube. He's awesome. Um, because his voice is very calming to me in moments of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. So, um, but Edmund uh, is a secret magic nerd. Not that secret, because you do put... I'm not, I, that's not something I hide, man. I'm a fucking huge magic nerd. I mean, the, uh, my life is... Uh, my actual personal life with my wife, and then there's video games, right? And then there's magic. Um, I would say that, like, movies are in there as well. I'm, I'm a pretty big movie buff, and, um, of course, I listen to a lot of music as well. But when it comes to, like, I have dedicated days to magic. Like, I go to Friday Night Magic at the mall here, and I play whatever, you know, sets out draft-wise. And on Saturdays, usually, at least every other Saturday, we queue at my place. And if we don't cube, we're doing something else magic-related. Whatever, drafting a new set or messing around with something. When you cube, so. do you cube your cube, or do people bring their cubes? Or oh, we, we cube, cube my cube. cube. Okay. Yeah. I've been cubing your cube on Cube Tutor. Yeah. And the one thing I can say about Cube Tutor, and I love the site, and I have nothing bad to say about Cube Tutor, the bots aggressively draft blue. <laughs> like, if you don't. You can't cut blue, you can't go mono blue, because the bots eat up all of the blue all of the time. Yeah, and there's a lot so, of high, high picks in blue. I actually powered down blue a little bit by adding the that Thopter enchantment. Oh, uh, Spy Network. Yeah, just... Uh, I love like, okay. that card. I love I that card. I'll give, I'll, give, I'll give another draft run that doesn't fit in, like, power blue, you know? Blue yeah. is not... Uh, and I a mean, specific deck's going to want that over... Just I'm gonna grab all the good blue cards. You know, and I mean it's a good it's a good build around card for a cube. My cube isn't and you, <coughs> actually you drafted my cube once. It's um modern commons and uncommons. Yeah. Um so it's not like super powerful or anything like that. But if I bent the rules, I would put that in. I just think it's got a really unique effect. It's close to the fairy enchantment that poops out a fairy every turn. Yeah, it's like a bad it's like a bad um uh, uh, God, my brain. Yeah, I used to have a encyclopedic just, uh, memory of the card. It's like such a fucking common. Everybody knows what that card is. Um, oh man, too bad you can't edit this. I feel like a fool. Oh, I don't know. I'm not. Um, <laughs> this is what we do. Um, on the show, so listeners of the show are gonna be like, oh yeah. Uh, uh, what's that card name? Uh, Bitter Blossom. Yeah, there it is. I always keep I, in my head, I, knew, I, I, I knew there was a B, and I'm like, what is B? B. How does that do to the fairies? I can't think. B. Okay, so a few, a few. One thing to start out, just because I'm a total geek for video games, I've been playing since like 1988, um, I, when I first got my first Nintendo. Um, I love Isaac, uh, so I have to just say that um, because. It really takes me back to like the beginning of my video gaming, and um, so it's hard as balls. It's randomly generated. Like a, I feel like a lot of those early games were. Um, I'm a huge Zelda fan, so all of the all of the iconery there is really cool, um, and all the magic stuff in it's really awesome. So like. Um, and I know Afterbirth hopefully will be out, you know, whenever it comes out. But super excited about that. Um, <laughs> but I'm only like I've only played Rebirth like 45 hours because with 
the original Isaac, I didn't have a child, but now I do. So I haven't got to dedicate the amount of time to it. But um, yeah, no. Um, and I like your dev your development blog. Uh, so uh, very fun stuff. Um, so thank you for putting all the time you have into the game. Um, yeah. It's definitely an awesome experience to sit down and WASD for a couple of hours. So it's it's fun to make games. It's uh, the only thing more fun than playing games is making them. Um, it is a lot more fun than playing them. It's pretty surprising. It's something I never really think about. I I I prefer to make games than play them. I do like playing games, of course. Um, but with the extra time I have, I usually just. Might as well double down on, you know, work and play at the same time. But, yeah, game design can be very fun, especially just the design aspect. It's fun to come up with stuff and, like, uh, you know, kind of crack the code in a way, you know, making things fun, making things make sense. And there's a lot of just, like, hypothesizing of, hey, would this be fun? Sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes you're wrong. But I've gotten, I think I've gotten pretty good. I've... <clears throat> and to the point where I think I can design on paper pretty well and it pretty much come out the way I assume. There's there's always some, you know, build arounds you gotta improvise as you go, but uh yeah, game design uh pretty fun. I nope. recommend And I mean I've noticed that in like rebirth, um Isaac had a lot of skill testing stuff going on and I think rebirth added a layer of it as well, so like and that's something that I think overlaps with magic design a lot, um, which I don't know if you intentionally did, but not every oh, item, sure. not every item is a plus. Sometimes you end up with like a C minus um, yeah. if you go through a run. So um, I learned a great deal from magic when it, when it just comes to basic design and how things work, and they've been tuning this formula for so long, and it's kind of reminiscent of new Legos in a way. I don't know if you um, still build Legos, but Legos have gotten, Legos have leveled up considerably. They're not how they used to be. And I feel like what happened was a lot of the people that kind of grew up playing Magic as well as playing with Legos hit, you know, around 25 to 30 and started working for them. And they just have a deeper understanding, a better understanding of all this stuff and, and uh, more rich. Like, I, I just like how artistic magic has come when it comes to its design and flavor. I, I like how, how how deep cards can go, like you can design a theme around it or an action. Like the new Planeswalkers are a great example of storytelling through design. Like That's really, really cool. And that's something that is really special about games and how you can kind of tell a story through mechanics. Um, in the kind of similar way, I guess, you could say that chess was like that. Like chess was telling the story of like a hierarchy of you know of rule and uh, it, it, it has interesting an interesting commentary on how things kind of work and I think it's cool that magic can do that with its mechanics um, and I try to do that with my games I try to make the uh, the gameplay uh, be part of the story and not just some sort of like you know here's a, a paragraph to read so you know what's going on in the game like I want you to experience the game with your actions what's happening on screen, what you're picking up, what you're fighting, and, and, and kind of let the story come into place with the mechanics and not, not just, you know, some other medium like a video or, a, you know, some, a book. Someone's writing a story or something. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, I personally, I feel that when I sit down to play Isaac, um, I mean, I just, um, not to sound like too much of a Isaac noob, I just unlocked the D6 for Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> recently um like within the last week um so uh because i hadn't unlocked the chest yet um so like that's just my level of isaac play but that's what i'm comfortable with i don't want to it's, it's totally fine you just chip away at it as you go it's, it's um you don't want to eat it all up like cobalt or any of the other i think uh Biznap also ate it all up within the first like week of uh release yeah um, no those guys, though, they're on a different level than I think a lot of people probably. <laughs> yeah, no, they're on a different level than me. I mean, they uh, when designing it, it, it is similar to Magic. Like uh, Isaac is very similar to the structure of, of Magic. I I kind of design the game 
almost in a draft-like situation. It, if, if I ever do a sequel, I'll probably try this out, try to make this more um, obvious. But, like, let's say you're playing with Maggie, and Maggie's more, you know, uh, hit point based. She has more life and she can regenerate more. Um, you kind of lean towards a draft archetype where it's like, hey, since I've got a lot of expendable life, I can lean towards items and strategies where I utilize my life as a resource, you know? And different characters kind of do different things and different item skill sets, you know, like different item sets do different things. So if you start, hey, I'm starting to pick up a lot of guppy items or I found guppy's foot or whatever else, you try to maximize the odds by opening up all the red chests you can, you know, going into cursed rooms so you can find more guppy pieces so you can become guppy. And there's, there's a lot of little draft strategies that go pretty deep that are very reminiscent of magic draft arounds as well as just magic play in general. And like you did bring up, like there are items that are simply not great, um, but just like in Magic, you play with those if you draw them, you know? You use them to the best of your ability, and uh, there's something to that, I think, that uh, that makes things interesting, you know? You can't just have an OP run every single time. Well, you can if you're the really crazy skilled players that can maximize the odds, but uh, for the most part, people aren't always OP, and uh, for every OP run, you've got to have a really shitty run. And it feels better sometimes to beat somebody with like a a little one one creature uh, attacking every turn, and getting through, than just uh, you know winning by stopping the hell out of them every single time. Yeah, by playing a premiable titan and then it's taking over the game or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, recently, one more Isaac thing, and then we'll switch to what we're actually here to talk about. First item room, uh, book of revelations. Okay, and I was like, I'm finally gonna get Meat Boy. Finally gonna get Meat Boy, and then I fought Conquest. Yeah, and I was That's like, a, that, that, "That is a definite flaw." I um, want to punch Conquest in the face. I mean, I <laughs> Conquest. I mean, in hindsight, I probably should. There's so many. There's so many little things I want to fix, and there's a big update coming that is probably going to come alongside Afterbirth that updates the Lost and a bunch of stuff that you're not anywhere close to right now. But um, yeah, that is one of the things that I thought I, I didn't, I didn't, just didn't think. There's just so much going on in the game. I forget that you could run into Conquest as a horseman and he only drops one item. I really should have, the fix to that would be that he will drop both and then only pick up one. The, there's a new feature in, um, Afterbirth. There are double, double treasure rooms, um, and uh, much like the, well, you're not there yet, but there's the uh, negative, no, yeah, you're there, the negative and the, uh, the Polaroid. And, uh, you know, you pick up one, the other one disappears. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to do that a lot more, uh, like I said before. Like, I'd like to be able to make it so the player has a bit more control over the direction of their build um, and, uh, like, kind of how they want to play. So giving options is good. Now, there, you kind of run into the whole, like, well, then all one item is clearly better than the other. But hopefully if we do a sequel, I'll be able to balance the items a bit more. But, oh. yeah, I should, I, should, I should fix that. Did you play any of the Unholy Edition? Did I play the Unholy Edition? The Not the Unholy Edition. The update that was done for um, original items. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, no, I can't say that I really did. I, I tested it out as Florian was sending it to me because he, like, whenever he put something in, he wanted my approval. Um, you know, is this good? What do you think about this? That was the the um, Eternal Edition. Eternal Edition, that's it. Yeah. That whole thing kind of came about where Florian was just bored and wanted to... He loves Isaac, he wanted to work on it, and he couldn't really work on Rebirth because he can't program in that language. Right. He knows Flash. And uh, he was like, I want to I wanna do something fun. I want to I wanna troll, you know, <laughs> I want to troll people. I'm like, all right. And I can tell you right now that I had to, to, to uh, rope him in a few times. If you thought, the, if you thought that the Eternal Mode was... Uh, Trolly, you don't even know. Like it, it, we got much worse. I know he's like done very... a couple. He's done a couple updates to tone it down a little. Yeah, like, I went in when it dropped, and I went in and I started playing it, and I picked up a double bomb, and one of them was really a troll bomb, and I was like, oh, this is a whole new level of <laughs> of mean. So that's uh, actually one thing I liked. There, there was a feature that he put in where. Sometimes if you pick up a bomb, instead of you picking it up, it'll just light the fuse and it'll become a troll bomb. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty cute. I no, like it's, that. It, he definitely beautiful. stumbled upon some really cool ideas for, um, 
for some enemy types as well as uh, some uh, more trophy aspects of Isaacs, which you need that stuff in order to keep things interesting. But he no. did a good job. No, I, I really like it. Um, and somehow he found a way around, like, some of the flash problems, like... Yeah, I don't even know what he did, but he, yeah, I mean, you level up as you as you go, and I guess he figured out a way to do it. For a while, we couldn't even open up the FLA because it would just crash it whenever he would try to publish it. But I think he got a new computer. He got, like, a really good computer. It's still, I think it was, the odds were, like, 1 in 10 that it would, maybe more, like, 1 in 5 that it would just crash if you would try to publish it, when, which is a huge pain in the ass when you're trying to develop something and you're just tuning things and then trying to test them. Um, but, uh, Flash is not, was not made to do what we were doing with it. Ah, uh, which is good, because you've abandoned Flash. You've left it behind <laughs> yeah. forever. Seems like everybody's abandoned Flash at this point. I um, still use it for, for all my art, though. All my art animation for everything that I'm working on. I'm, I'm releasing a new game, um, probably the next couple weeks, called Fingered. And, uh, it's kind of a little game that, um, me and James Id, who did... He did a lot of my uh, trailers for all my different games. He's a video artist and uh, and programmer. And we made this game called Fingered, and I did it all in Flash, but he actually programmed it in some, like, HTML5 or something. Awesome. I don't know what HTML5 is, but uh, yeah. that's just not where my level of computer junk is. But, um, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll track down Fingered when I can. Um, not sure. Don't spoil anything, of course, because... <laughs> oh. But is, is it more like your like the basement collection level of games? Yeah, or? yeah, it's okay. more it's more like a game from the basement collection for sure. Okay. It's more Actually. like build stuff. It's kind of like back to basics. I just want to make a fun game, and it started out as like a little weekend project, and then uh, we worked on it for you know a couple months on the weekends. So it's it's a very small project, but it's pretty interesting. Um, I haven't seen many things like it. It's uh, it's weird. It's very weird, and I think people might appreciate the humor and oddness of it. It'll be super cheap too, so it won't be like a it'll be a lot cheaper than it'll be the cheapest game that I have on Steam. Um excellent. Okay, so um a couple prim starting out magic questions. Um how long have you been playing? Um I started playing uh during revised uh so like ninety four. Yeah, something like that. Um, maybe in 94 or something. It was the summertime, so like summer of 94, the end of 94-ish. Yeah. Um, yeah. I started playing, uh, uh, a friend of mine played Magic, and then uh, we, we went to the boys club together during that summer. Um, and uh, he was like, you got to see this game called Magic. It's really awesome. I'm like, um, he, I'm watching these kids play, and I see this guy play a Keldon Warlord. And I'm like, whoa, that look, guy looks awesome. I like the art in it. And then he's like, yeah, he gets bigger depending on how many creatures you have in play. And that was like, that's what it sold me. It like instantly sold me. I'm like, oh, okay. So there's like, you could make your own decks and you could make it make sense to what your, your deck is. And I'm like, oh, I got to get some. So I had, I think I had 10 bucks. I went to the local comic shop. They had a pack of, a pack of unlimited for $6.99. They had a pack of Legends for like eight ninety nine, and then they had a starter pack of Revised that just came out, and I think it was seven ninety nine. And I was like, "Well, I get like sixty cards in that one," so I bought that. And understandable, <laughs> even though looking <laughs> yeah, back and, I, and limited. And then I opened up a Bayou. I opened up a Bayou, Ooh. and I was like, "I was like Bayou," and and uh, the guy's like, "It's worth two dollars." Um, you can trade in. I think I had a couple different rares. I had the the, the sought after card at the, of that time was the was a was a oh fuck the dragon um, Chivan dragon Chivan yeah and uh, uh, yeah dual lands were worth two to two fifty and I traded in my dual land and something else for another pack of revised cards which I opened up of a Suvin doppelganger. Ooh, that's so, a that good one favorite, too. Uh, my favorite art. It's great. It's amazing art. I just started a show where um, for my the channel that I do stuff for, and um, I'm going to go through and review every set of Magic chronologically. Yeah. Uh, because I, I just want to have something to do in my downtime. <laughs> and um, so I just reviewed Alpha, Beta, and Unlimited as one show, because they're basically the same set with some a few exceptions. Yeah. And that art back then before you know somebody that knew that knows kind of more what they're doing with art 
Um, it's less comic booky. It's more. Yeah, I feel more artistic, and it none of it's like computer animated yeah. or computer designed. So it's all just a different feel. Not, yeah. I mean, the art now is a lot cleaner. You can tell what's going on, and it represents the cards better. But I mean, I love Anson Maddox, and I don't think like he couldn't go to Wizards now as a starting out Wizards artist and go, "Hey guys, I want to do magic art for you guys." What do you think of my... Times have definitely changed. Like, I... Like, Quentin Hoover is my favorite artist by far. Mark Tedden is probably the other one. Um, I like Insomatics as well. Um, I like the really weird stuff. The really, like... I can't remember his name, but there's a guy who did watercolor, and it looked... Everything looked super complicated and really jagged. And just... Uh, I think he did... Something like something emissary. He did a lot of, like, crazy-looking complicated cards. I even like some of the more, like comic booky stuff from the Mirage time that was, there's like the carry-on card, the, the like dead thing with a, full of maggots. It looked really super detailed. I think that was a comic artist and I really like that stuff too. Um, it's really interesting. Um, a friend of mine for my birthday uh, made me like this big big sheet, like a big poster of all of Quentin Hoover's um, cards. Like all of them all, all together, like chron chronologically. And you can kind of see as time goes by um, the last cards that Quentin Hoover did, you wouldn't know that he did them because it was pretty obvious that Wizards told him that let's let's move towards this new look where things look more realistic, not as stylized. You know, like he he has a, he has a card in standard right now. He has that that uh, that the new mana dork that that costs two is a two one. Leaf, oh, the, the Leaf Gilder. Yeah, Leaf Gilder. That's him. That's Quentin Hoover. And you would never think that it was him because his style was so insane back in the day with, like, Regeneration and even Wrath of God and stuff like that. Like, so iconic, but they kind of, you know, muted it in a way. I mean, they, he did Ball Lightning. He did a lot of really fucking cool stuff. Like, uh -huh. he he did some great, great cards. No, yeah, he... Um... But yeah, and in the end, the end. Well, he he's dead now. Uh, yes, sadly, he, unfortunately. He died. Um, but uh, the last cards that he did, he did um, he did a bunch of those uh, rebels, um, which you wouldn't think either that he did a bunch of white ones. Right. They just blend in with every other card. I don't know. I, I'm a bit critical of, of Wizards' choice. I, I can understand how they are going for a brand. They want it to look, you know, uniform. They want everything to look the same. And they want it to look pretty realistic and not so stylized. And I guess they, they're trying to move away from all that stuff. But I almost feel like it would be very appropriate and very nostalgic for them in some sort of summer set. Uh, like maybe another uh, Modern Masters or something. If they were to go backwards and like get some almost pop artists to come in and do some cool art for for some cards. I think, I think, it's, I think it's time... I mean, I, I even appreciate some stasis art, man. Like, just give me some weird stuff again. I, I like it. I don't know. There's something about it that that feels magic to me. It feels that's what, what I grew up with. I guess it's probably just nostalgia, but I I like the I like the range of, of art instead of just having everything look the same. It does definitely the stasis art feels like you're just never gonna get to do anything for the rest of your life. That's <laughs> just sitting there going, why am I still playing? But I pulled up all the Quentin Hoover cards. He did Whispers of the Muse, which is just an insane, like, a personal favorite card of mine. And he did the original Wrath of God art, which is so yeah, iconic kind of... to magic. So Yeah, that's a badass card. Yeah, um, we don't get it anymore. He even did my favorite him, the Turok art, which I didn't realize. So, but yeah, no, great artist. Um, so, um, let's see. Okay, and so playing... Um, Maybe about a year longer than I have. Um, favorite color? I did stop. I, I stopped. Huh. I um, I saved up. How old was I? I was probably seventeen, maybe when Ice Age came out. I saved up for my first box of Magic cards, um, eighty five, eighty nine dollars, and I box a, I got a box of Ice Age when it came out. When the day it came out, I was so excited. And Ice Age was the set that stopped me from playing Magic. It was like the worst set ever, <laughs> and it was like on the. Right after, like, Homelands and a bunch of other bad sets. Oh, and um, uh, what was that really bad mini set that they did? Uh, Fallen Empires? Fallen Empires. Yeah, all around that time. It was like, 
that was the that was bad. That was a bad time. <laughs> bad time for all Magic players. The, the thing about Fallen Empires is, like, thematically, it was amazing because all of the colors were fighting themselves, right? But yeah. the execution was just so poor. Not only that, but you could open a pack and get, like, five of the same card because they had yeah, to figure out were, were there, They yet. weren't rares. They were uncommons, right? Yeah, it was commons and uncommons. You got, like, yep. two uncommons and the rest were commons. At least we got him, right? Him. Him, and um, there's a couple other fringe playables, but him is, like, the big card from the set. Oh, yeah, but there's also a High Tide. High Tide is another good, kind of forgotten, loved card from from Fallen Empire. Back in the day, I remember that time, though, everybody was running the mono black Necropotence, and everybody ran all the Order of the Ebon Hand guys. Yeah, black, black Summer or Black Winter, whatever you call it, just because yeah. of... All the Necro and then Stasis came along. Um, one of the guys on the podcast is, um, his name is Dan Horning. He was a Swedish national champion during that time frame. And um, so he's got a lot of stories of Necro, playing Necro, playing Stasis, playing other decks that are um, really interesting if you can get past his Swedish accent, which is really hard <laughs> to work with. But um uh, so, yeah, my first box of Magic ever was Homelands. Yeah. Um, which is just such a stinker of a set. <laughs> um, just, uh, and you could tell, like, at that point, they were still having, like, people from all over the greater United States and Canada design sets for them on the fly. And they were like, do whatever you want to do and then we'll add our own flavor when we get the cards so like sometimes they were like well this set is going to end up being about this and then the mechanics wouldn't make any sense and yeah so like magic was a mess um it's better now but like it's a hell of a lot better now but sometimes you feel like maybe those earlier sets maybe had a little more fun to them i i feel like having I, less balance. I can understand. Like they, they, I remember a recent. So in recent sets, um, I've noticed that there are a lot of people. A lot of people who are like, yeah, like dragons was a great set, but I don't know. I just didn't like drafting it. And I, I think that a lot of that comes from the fact that dragons was one of the better sets when it comes to how well they balance things. There was no one way to go that would always win and i feel like people don't like that that much yeah i feel like the the, the the like level playing field people like wait no i want to dominate like i want to draft mono red and dominate you know people, like, people want to go into an archetype that they know and just jam it every time yeah they draft. Just, like, and just and just take it to the end when it's not you know they're so tuned and so balanced that it's not a guarantee you're not going to just dominate with one draft strategy, no. which is definitely something, I mean, I know from experience that I used to do. Like, you know, you just draft this, and if you get the cards, you're good to go. And that's why, why the good players that can read signals and jump around and stuff are good players, and that's why I never play limited on MTGO, because I know I'm just wasting my money. Because <laughs> there's always it's, guys that are grinding those cues and stuff so but um dragons was a decent set um i didn't care for megamorph i felt it was a little kidly as far as the ability they could have done more with it but overall i like the design of the set i really liked exploit um, yeah maybe a little bit more than i should um did you watch any of Prince of origins this weekend i don't know if your I schedule did. allows I, that I, i'm not yeah it's my my magic Fanaticism doesn't go that deep in like Pro Tour stuff. I don't. I don't know who's doing what and what's being played. Like, I stick to drafting standard and playing cube. Um, well, this weekend, um, the only reason to bring it up <laughs> is the whole thing was won, won by a guy playing an insult artifact deck, <laughs> which is the enchantment from M15. That turns an artifact into a five-five creature. Yeah, crazy, just like insane deck. Just really fun to watch. Um, not that it was the most fair um, environment, but um, 
So, but yeah, I, I watch. I like watching high level play. Um, so I like to watch the stream on Twitch, um, just because watching pros play, like you glean things from what they do. I do. Um, so I like watching that. But um, so favorite color? It, I don't know if you're a player that has one or favorite card overall. Like since I do, yeah. I, my favorite color. I mean, it's it's blue. Okay. But uh, I always lean towards blue. I like playing control. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, I'm all over the place. I never, I never really lean any direction when I'm drafting, especially in cube. I will I sometimes will lean away from blue because I know it's overdrafted, and I know like I want to beat the blue player with some awesome synergy than you know anything else. Yeah, people but, uh, found blue in cube. They just love blue. <laughs> I'll splash blue. If I, if I get some broken cards. But, um, yeah, my favorite card's probably Remand. Oh. Remand just, is a... It's an elegant card. It's Yeah, I think it's a really, really, really great card. I, it's, it's, um... I think... It's one of those cards that has different levels to it, and, and the different depending on the level of the player, you see it as different things. Like, I will swear up and down that that is a time walk. Um, that is an early game time walk, and I will... Love to play it always. Other people will be like, well, I just put the card back in their hand. They're going to just play it again. And I don't know. It's just a, the perfect tempo card. It, it is almost a time walk. It is an awesome card, and I love it. And, yeah. Uh, it's in, it, it's it, in it's my so cube. Huh. No, I mean, and you, it's just the, I guess it's always going to be the play level of the person you're playing where they may not understand that tempo hit yet. Yeah. Um, but no, I love Remand. Um, I see in your cube, at least online, you're rocking the original art, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so, um, let's see other topics of interest. Well, one of the reasons, um, besides the fact that I love your games and all that, that I wanted you to come on is you actually got to design a card for M15, um, yeah. Curl Sadist, um, and I have it brought up on screen. Um, because unfortunately it wasn't one of the standout cards from M15. It couldn't really compete with like Goblin Rabble Master or um, Genesis Hydra, some of the other cards that actually were played out of M15. But what was the process like um, I, for what you can talk about and all that good stuff? Yeah, I had, um, it was essentially like, hey, throw some stuff at us. And uh, I know, I think the, some of the other players kind of just have general ideas, like I want to have a card that kills lands, or I want to have a card that is based around this joke, you know, and then you you figure it out sort of things. And I, but I, like, for me, I had, it's one of those, I wish I could go back in time and do a different card. It sounds so stupid, but the whole time, like, I'm thinking like, oh my God, I'm making a magic card. It's got to be awesome. Like, I got to do something cool. It's got to feel like something I would do, it's got to be something I'd play, you know, it's all this other stuff, and uh, I had a shitload of cards um, that I proposed, and there was a cycle that I proposed to them that I wanted them to kind of choose from, um, and it was a cycle of children, and they were all one-drops, and uh, I'm a big fan of one-drops, and especially good ones, and I, I kind of wanted to push that and see where I could go with it. And uh, they liked the green one, the blue one, and the black one. And uh, the green one was just like a little fungusaur. I think it was like a, um, an O... It was an O2 fungusaur that cost one green and had flesh. Oh. That um, would actually work a lot better than the original fungusaur. Yeah. <laughs> so, I... And that was cute, and I... Oh, you know, maybe I should have gone that direction, because that was straight up there like, that would work. Perfect. It's like, I don't know, the blue one is the one I like the most. The blue one was a one drop that was an 0-1 that could untap your uh, untap a land, but only on your opponent's turn. Um, which I think is neat, and I don't think has been really been done. But they uh, said so due to core set, like, they want to stay away from more complicated things, like only on the other player's turn type stuff, like extra rule sets that haven't been in place. So they shied away from that. But, you know, I like the idea. It feels blue. Um, it's a green thing that blue should do, you know, like being able to play on their turn, activate artifacts, um, that sort of stuff I think is kind of neat. Uh, and then there was the, the black one, which was uh, originally, I believe, designed as 
a very simplistic one, one drop, one, one, that you could tap it, pay a life, put a counter, or one, one counter on it, tap it, remove all counters, and shoot anything. And um, that was it. That was, it was a really super simplistic, elegant card. I thought it was cool. And since it was black, I felt like it would fit, fit me a bit more. And I decided to push with that. And um, for a long time, it stayed as that design, which I feel like is pretty damn good. And uh, when they went through testing it, I started to get pushback where it's like, oh, you know, we, let's, we're, we're trying it out. It's a bit too good. But see, I'm in the dark when it comes to anything else. Like all I, I, they don't even give me any information on the set. All I'm doing is designing this card. And if I say, hey, let's try this. And they say, no, that's not going to work. And I say, why? They don't say anything. They can't tell me. They can't right. tell me any information on any sets that haven't right. been revealed or the set that's coming out. It's just about the card. So a lot of the times I'll be like, well, what's going on? And they'll be like, uh, we can't. There's, a, there's a conflict with the card in an upcoming set, so we can't do that. So I saw as the card get, got powered down, um, and it stands now as, you know, you have to pay one black, tap it, pay a life to put a counter on it. Um, and you have to pay three to shoot something with it, and um, you can only hit creatures. Um, you used to be able to hit players. And I later found out when the new set comes out that it was all because of the whole Outlaw stuff. Oh. So it was all because if you could get counters on a card and shoot things so easily like that, that mean the next set was based around putting counters on. I know, like, I inadvertently designed a card that fit into a guild. You did. It actually set. is Abzan. Yep. Wow. I didn't even think about that, but it is a really good Abzan card. It would have fit really nicely into cons. So, yeah. So, like, I, 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 whoops, I designed around something that would have been too good with the next set, and I got a power down, which is, it's still, it's, it was still good. You know, I still got to play with it um, and draft with it and uh, saw people play with it, which is cool. But, yeah, sadly, it wasn't wasn't the elegant design that I initially pushed for, but understandably so, they had to, they had to uh, fix it. Awesome. Um, I mean, did you have any urge? No, probably not, just because you're a magic nerd, to go, like, the Gurik Sweat Chili Fart route or anything like that? Yeah, no. I, I, I wanted to stay away from any, like, jokey joke stuff or any self-referential stuff. I wanted to make a magic card. You know, I'm a magic fan, and I wanted to make a magic card. And you definitely, I mean, you did. Unfortunately, yeah, M15 was kind of just an overall odd set. It felt like, not like a core set, it felt like a greatest hit sort of set. And, <laughs> I mean, it released right before or right after they made the announcement that it was going to be the second to last core set, with Origins being the last core set. Yeah. So I felt like they did it in a strange spot. But um, I'm going to be, I feel sad to see the core sets go. Um, yeah, but I mean, it, if they're going, it might, I don't know, it, it'll, it might be, make things interesting. Maybe there's going to be, I mean, do they have to make another set to replace it? They're doing the, th it's going to be three blocks a year from now on. Every single one. Yeah, so uh, Battle for Zendikar will come out, and then what, three months later, set two will come out. Then three months later... A big set, then a small set, then a big set, and a small set. And that'll be the whole year of Magic. So we're going to get three different blocks a year, basically. No more third sets, no more core set. Yeah. And it feels like it's going to be more concentrated. Like, they can do a lot better with the mechanics and stuff. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it's a financial decision, realistically. Like, core sets just simply don't sell as well. I mean, if I, I love Origins, but... I mean, Origins is not, dude, like, Origins is so not a core set. Like, Origins is a draft set. Like, that, that, Origins feels like Modern Masters when it comes to the draft environment and the archetypes. It's one of the better sets that they've done, I think. It's probably one of the best, draft-wise, one of the best, I'd say the best core set that they've ever done. I mean, are you taking 5th um, edition into that with its 529 cards? I mean, come on. <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, gosh. It was gigantic, and it was in standard for, like, almost two years. <laughs> so, yeah. like, you really got familiar with them, or with 5th edition way back in the day. Because, um, yeah, this, it just sat there for months and months and months. And 
Well, I, I should mention I didn't I didn't finish my thought from before. Oh, okay. So I stopped Sorry. playing Magic around Ice Age, but then I got back into Magic when Ravnica appeared. Oh wow, that's a long break. Yeah, so I had a big a big gap there of just not playing Magic. I had friends that played Magic, so I got like random updates, like when Dark Steel and stuff was happening. I got these like, dude, there, there's people are making decks now that went on turn two and they're broken as hell. I'm like, oh okay, well, I don't know. Doesn't sound that great. But the thing is, is see, I didn't know. I didn't know. No one drafted when I was playing. There was no drafting. Oh. Like, I didn't know anybody who drafted. I knew nothing about it. So, I was just... I I didn't know shit until, you know, uh, Ravnica popped out. And then it was like, hey, there's this new set. It looked really appealing to me. I can't place why. It just looked really good. And the, the mechanics made sense. And then someone's like, you should draft. And I'm like, what's draft? And then they explained it, and I was completely sold. And, like, you know, drafting magic is just really addicting and very fun. Um, oh, I and can... I kind of jumped back into it. And even though I was much older, I got thrown, man, these, they, they were ruthless. <laughs> I can say, <laughs> like, Ravnica, original Ravnica, Wizards, like, they went all out to make that, like, the most appealing, like, set, draft environment for constructed it's i mean it's gorgeous the art's amazing the design it's a little weaker now because they took damage on this off the stack and that was a big part of like a lot of the cards in the set but yeah. it's gorgeous um so but yeah i really i really got into it and then that was the second box of magic like i drafted it a few times and i was like i'm buying a box of magic cards and i broke out all my old cards I, there's a sad part to this story. This happened around Meat Boy development time, and um, I think the thing that got me back into it was because in order to make ends meet, um, I ended up selling almost all my collections of everything. And uh, so I sold all my NES games. I had like 450 NES carts, like a whole collection. I sold all those. I sold my whole DVD collection from back then and a bunch of video games. And then I started selling all my Magic cards, and I sold all my dual lands. Um, and a bunch of other stuff to just make enough money to kind of finish Meat Boy. And, uh, but in doing so and putting them up, I started seeing other cards and it got me interested and eventually I started moving back towards it. And then, um, I think, uh, Ravnica pulled me back in and really kind of was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I think everybody has like a sell-off story, but not everybody ends their sell-off story with, oh yeah, and I have this awesome incredibly hard platforming game that makes um, some people pull their hair out trying to play. Uh, yeah, Meat Boy definitely helped when it came to uh, getting all the cards that I kind of sold off that, uh, I, I mean, it, yeah, when, when I started getting in the cube, um, I had to, you know, I needed all these cards in order to, to make a cube, and uh, I was like, oh shit, I sold so many of them, but the cool thing was is I actually found some, some old cards that I just had that I didn't sell because I didn't realize that they were worth anything. And I had a, I had a, um, this is my my coolest treasure story for Magic. I went to the flea market, um, and this was when I wasn't playing Magic, and I saw two decks. I don't remember what set it was, but you probably know once I tell you the cards that were in it. They were just two starter boxes. Um, I bought them, I looked through the cards, put them away, forgot about them. And then uh, around Ravnica, when I started playing again, I broke them out, um, looked through them, pilfered them for a deck, put them back, and then when I started to get into cube, and I was like, okay, I need to get these cards, I'm looking through, and I'm looking through my cards, I'm like, oh yeah, I have those starters, and I look through, and um, the starters weren't starters, they were decks that somebody made and just put in those packs, Wow. and uh, there were two show-and-tells, and two, um, that blue counter where you can toss a blue card and pay a life. Oh, first of all. First of all. So, that was rad. That's, uh, I mean, that's like uh, American Vickers level find. That's like, oh, I found this gold here in my bedroom. So. It was rad. Like, I I think I, I ended up uh, trading away, because there were two of each, trading away the, the, the doubles so I could get a bunch of other cube cards and then, of course, put Show and Tell and Force of Will in the cube. Yeah, absolutely. I have your cube brought up right now. I love the full token support. I love it. Uh, it's like, why why am I going to play with token producing cards if I don't go ahead and get the tokens? I I need them. So it's like the best way to bling out your cube. But your cube is fully blinged. 
um, like, you have the, the full art lands, you have the power nine, um, so... Full yeah. disclosure, that Power 9 is actually Collector's Edition Power 9. Um, They're still the most valuable cards in my cube. By far, I mean, the Collector's Edition Power 9 isn't too much less expensive than the Power 9, I mean. Yeah, like I... and Well, I see, I bought me, George, and Andy Hull. So Andy Hull is the programmer for Spelunky. He's the guy who got me into cube. George is also... A, he's, he's the guy that designed Genesis Hydra, and he made Plants vs. Zombies. These are my ultra nerdy magic friends who got me into cube. They showed me the way. And uh, George had got his hands on uh, a collector's edition for like 800 bucks or something. This was quite a few years ago. And I was like, I need that. And then I kept bidding on them on eBay for 800 bucks, but I refused to pay more than what George paid. <laughs> so I saw as the months went by of me being stubborn and not wanting to pay more than what he paid, um, I saw it go up to like, one thousand five hundred dollars and now it's up to like two thousand five hundred dollars yeah it's not i mean there's not a lot of them out there and i think people just like are just waiting for the price just to like skyrocket i mean two thousand dollars isn't a small amount but um i didn't it's know it's pretty astounding though to think that the most valuable cards in my cube aren't, aren't real like <laughs> they're not they're not real in, in, in the sense of, you know, magic. A lot it's, of, uh, a lot of like, older uh, vintage tournaments, legacy tournaments, they allow proxies, they allow collector's edition, and I think that's that why. Sense. I okay. think they're always going to have a value because they're, in a lot of the tournaments that you can play those cards, they're as good as having uh, Alpha Black Lotus in your deck. Um, yeah. So, but, but yeah, I, I don't think, think, I'm not the type of person that no matter what, you know, if I became Notch tomorrow, I, I don't, I don't feel right about purchasing a card for that amount of money. I, mean, I would just feel weird about playing with it. You know what I mean? Like, it's more of an investment and less of a card at that point. Yeah, like if if I had a card that was worth that much, I would feel weird about playing with it, and I feel like other people would be weird about handling it. Yeah, and you would always. I mean, unfortunately, in in the world. You'd always feel weird about having it out of your sight during the <laughs> yeah. cube environment. Like, yeah. okay, you who drafted the Black Lotus? Okay, you have to come build your deck next to me, and you have to play next to me for the rest <laughs> yeah, of no, the night. Like, uh, I don't know, you know, you know Tristan um, Gregson. Yeah. So he has an insane cube, like a crazy fucking cube. Everything's foiled, and he has all real everything. And I and he takes that whole cube places and has people draft it and I'm like how do you do it and he's like oh you know no one's gonna steal anything like it's like uh he counts the cards of course after to make sure everything's there but he says he's only run he's run into a few missing cards but they were never valuable cards it was just like random misplaced whatever well that's I mean that's nice I think the cube community like if you find people that are in the cube they kind of have a respect for cube for the most part yeah that they're like I don't want to break up this wonderful collection of insane plays. I don't want to <laughs> steal from a cube. I won't, I, I, I'm going to go steal from the comic book. No, I'm joking. But, <laughs> um, so, but yeah, no, uh, cube has become my favorite, um, format. Um, just because the, I had a lot of fun. It took me like a year to design my cube and then like three months to put it together because um, I was really concerned about balance and I wanted to get good cards and um, I don't think magic I don't think they do enough to support cube online unfortunately and it's really hard to get eight people together to draft cube for me uh, so it's awesome that like you have a good play group that comes yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely grateful for the fact that I can usually get eight people to draft cube and they're all it's taken years I mean I've it's taken years to get friends and or acquaintances that I can tolerate. You know what I mean? Like there's some questionable people who play magic and that questionable, uh, personality, uh, gets worse as it goes up in skill level. So when people are drafting cube, you get some nerds out there who don't have the social skills to pay the bills. And I've, I've run through quite a few of them and I'm like, okay, well I'll give you a try. I play, I play with you at the mall. We'll, We'll see. We'll see how you act in my house. And no, nope. 
I mean, inviting somebody into the inner sanctum is a whole <laughs> different level than drafting in a comic book shop. Because yeah. in the comic book shop, you don't have to really worry about things like personal grooming, their <laughs> their respect of stuff um, around them. Yeah. Um, but within the, your house, you have a lot more invested into your environment. Yeah. <laughs> so now I completely understand. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's been my kind of general experience with um magic going all the way back to high school where i would go in on a friday night and play magic and then go back in the next friday night and one of the guys and great player he was like in my state back then there was like the state championships and for like three years in a row he was like the kansas state champion but he would literally be wearing the same shirt not the same shirt that he had washed and stuff but like the same sh shirt that had, like, formed a bond with him, like, Spider-Man in the black suit. <laughs> like, oh, man, this, like, this rank, but I don't think I ever beat him. I mean, that's my second clearest memory is, like, one time I played him and he was playing, a, a like, a sealed deck. And I was playing my constructed deck and he still beat me. <laughs> I was like, wow, well, I feel like <laughs> that's I got... Always, it's always the worst. Like, I, I've had exper bad experiences with assholes, actual assholes, um, online who will be talking major shit, and then I'm like, luckily it's usually in the cube environment, and when I, when I play cube online, I'll play, I rarely play seriously, I'm playing for some weird fringe shit that just goes on forever, but I still do well, I still usually go infinite when I'm playing cube, um, and every once in a while I'll run to the, you know, asshole that's, that wants to tell me I suck. And um, and then I can rub it in when I beat him. But I have lost twice to two different guys who are total dicks, and it hurt deeply. <laughs> it's like you shouldn't. God, you're just you're telling me how much I suck the whole time, and now you're winning. God. Uh, I love. I mean, the powered cube. I will. I will go and do the powered cube when they bring it back, the holiday cube, because yeah. it's insane. It's always good, even if they like bring in some like underpowered cards from the latest set. It's yeah, always, but, it's always yeah. amazing. So, like Jessica Ascension, like wow. Uh, I, I, I could see, I could see your last picks from a million miles away. Why are you adding these three color cards that no one will play? Uh, especially like oh wedge cards. Let's just cram a whole bunch of wedge cards in there, like. But there's no wedge support in the queue. Why are you doing yeah. that? But it's, um. Yeah, there's some odd choices for sure. Yeah, I don't understand why they don't put up cube more often. Like, why? Like, they would get so much more money from me if, like, Modern Masters 1, 2, uh, um, Old Zendikar, and, uh, and, and Cube and Holiday Cube were just were cycled constantly. As I, think, like, I think they like to keep them attractions for people. I just want to play more. God. I just want to play more cube. I just want to <laughs> abandon, abandon the rest of my cube. life. Or even like uh, Vintage Masters. I played the hell out of that too. Oh, I play. I did five Vintage Masters drafts, and I got four center red white each time. And I was like, oh, this set sucks. Oh, I hate it. But that's just because people were drafting me. Dude, I got beat. Like, I got pretty good at Vintage Masters at the end, and almost every single deck I played in the finals was red white. I, I never got there. I know I'm like I won two out of the five I did um, off of my red white just because the the stupid goblin um, that they four dropped. Two, yeah, dudes. that guy is just crazy good for four mana. I yeah, mean, like oh red, my god, I had all the crazy four drops. They, didn't they have a guy that like gained you a bunch of life and was this giant wall. Yeah, and a bunch of yeah. That's usually how I died. I I would tend to force black, um, what was it, black, black, white? Black, black white, white was really like good. They, they had all those really junky one and two drop cards that were just extremely aggressive in black. Um, and then like spinal graft and stuff, the stuff that no one would play. Like, that's what I really loved about Vintage Masters is there was these junk cards out there that made the strongest damn deck in the world. You could just stomp people to hell with it. You just had it all to yourself. You, yeah. Nobody else wanted it. And then, of course, there was the end where um, I tried. I drafted Storm and tried to force Storm for like ten. I, pl I played. I spent too much money, way too much money in that. And I, I think that I drafted. I tried to force Storm uh, ten times, 
<laughs> and uh, lost, of course, uh, all but one, I think. And then when I won, I was like, yeah, I'm done. One storm. <laughs> you were like, it was, storm. it's so frustrating because storm was so. Oh my god, it was so fun. Like it was so fun to play, but you never won. And the cool thing about playing storm though is. Even if you win or don't win, the, per the other person's just, like, clapping on the other end. It's like, yeah, kudos to you for trying. Like, that was – good job. You did it. Uh, like, no, no, I play uh, – my format of choice online is Popper, um, which is the all-common format. Um, it's kind of a fringe format. And Storm was, like, a nemesis, a built, like, a keyword for a long time in Popper. And then Wizards banned all the Storm cards. So, like, anytime you talk about Storm and you're talking to somebody who is popper-based, I'm like, empty the Warrens. There's no answers. There's no answers. So, and then I often will just run around my room panicking, rending of flesh, ripping of clothes. So, but that's just kind of when you're a popper player, you have bad memory. Um, so... Uh, other Magic designers, um, both of those games, Spelunky is amazing. <laughs> um, For sure. And the other game, I can't... Oh, Plants vs. Zombies. Even a, a tower defense game my wife will play. Um, yeah. So that's saying a whole bunch because she's more on the Tomb Raider. Did you realize that, that Plants vs. Zombies is also based around Magic? No. The whole thing is structured around mana base. And casting cards that are right in the oh, generator. The, the sun. It's and, all there, dude. It's huh, all magic. It is. That's amazing. And Spelunky, it's clearly based around Fallen Empires, right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Every single time I play, I feel like I'm hemming myself. <laughs> every, every time I'm just playing Ication Money Keepers and killing myself with them. Yeah. <laughs> that thing was a, a horrible card. Um, well, I feel like I've kept you for about an hour, which is about the amount of time that I wanted to spend talking to you. Do you have anything that you want to, I don't know, pimp or um, want to, I'll put a link to your cube in the show notes to get people to go out there and draft it. I know getting feedback from people yeah. is a good way to get go about, you know, like, hey, I love your cube, but like, these were my 12 last picks, and they're all garbage. Yeah, yeah, I definitely need more more statistics on my cube. I like feedback, you know. I like I like non-completely socially retarded feedback. Um, that's always good. Just tell um, me, tell me. I like to know the best. The best way to ask the questions is um, why did you choose to put this card in over this? Because then it makes me think like, oh, should I be playing this card over this card? And or why am I doing that? And it gives me a dialogue to kind of go with, um, which is always fun, but you know. Uh, on on Cube Tutor, I'm VBH, which is my short for my handle, Vault Boy Hunter. I couldn't get Vault Boy Hunter for some strange reason. Um, so you might look, and I did a, um, I did two this morning because I was up with heartburn. Don't get old. Um, and so I did a Simic deck based around opposition and tokens. Yeah. And I would play that in any environment. Like, literally, I would take that to a standard tournament, sit down with this 40 card deck, and I probably would lose. But it had, it had Jitty, it had a sword, ah, uh, and then I drafted a Esper control deck because that's kind of where I live. I love Esper and Cube. Um, I didn't really do good feedback because I feel like outside of the conspiracy cards, because they're really hard to, yeah. you know, they, there's no good representation on how they would actually function in a real draft environment. I feel like your cube is amazing. So you like, there's very few duds in it. Well, I don't think so. For the new ones. I, I honestly think I, I feel like all but Gideon new planeswalker wise, I feel like they might be duds. They need more testing, of course. George is, is pleading with me to test them out more, of course. But I've been playing with them a lot online, and it's like, especially with Jace, almost every single time I don't want to flip them, and the fact that I can't choose not to is weird. Oh, you just want to keep the loot effect on the board. Yeah, I just want the loot, and like, I feel like I feel like the looter that I took out to replace him is actually better and supports more 
archetypes. But I don't know. I'll, I'll try it more. Like you, George's argument was, of course, you know, what if you've got recall in your graveyard? Then it's awesome. Um, but I don't know. Like spells matters is pretty supported. Um, it's even in three colors at this point. So um, maybe it doesn't do enough. I don't know. But uh, yeah, and then of course the Thopter card. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, but but yeah, I actually I just started. I just started another cube. Um, I've been kind of going through the process of, I have a lot of foil cards and I don't really use foil cards in my cube cube. And um, I'm like, well, what if I made a secondary cube that was a 360 cube and I could support Storm? So I, I, I was trying to build around a 360 cube that's very powered, very small and supports Storm. And the, one of the biggest changes to my current cube is I think I'm gonna move almost all except for the better conspiracies from from that and put them in the power cube because or the the 360 cube because I think the 360 cube is going to be extremely explosive and really broken um, just by making it simply smaller um, and it's going to support storm and more fringy kind of uh, infinite mana type combo y things um, and uh, stuff that you can get away with supporting in a smaller cube only and they don't really work in like a five uh, 500 plus because you just don't get enough per pieces yeah yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna attempt that and uh um i think i'm gonna move the conspiracies over to that i think awesome. no i mean do you play with conspiracies at all in your in cube? mine i'm gonna get all of them and then have them separate and then i'm gonna be like hey do you guys want to draft with the wacky draft cards do you want to put the conspiracies like in Backup plan is the highest pick in my cube. That's the... Which one is that? I, I have your cube yeah, up, two, so... You get two hands. You draw 14 cards in two hands, and you choose which hand you want. And then you put one back. And then you put one back, shuffle it up. Uh, let's it's, see. That's really just good. phenomenally good. Phenomenally good. Like, it just... It's the fact that you don't... It's not like you mulligan. It's not like free mulligan. It's literally two hands. So you're like you're taking 14 cards off the top of your library and then realizing what's going back in and maximizing odds. It's really really good. And of course, double stroke. I think it is the card that like doubles whatever card you play. Right. Um, that is that is busted. That is a power power level. Those two cards are power level when it comes to like I do a rotisserie draft sometimes. Put everything on the table and have people pick one by one and. Those are definitely right in the power in the power slot uh, as far as when you pick them. I feel like I unexpected potential. plan first. I feel like unexpected potential would yeah. be a good one too. The the birth of paradise one. Awesome sauce. Awesome. Okay. Anything else like um, you want to talk about any of your game stuff that's coming out or? Oh yeah, I don't know if anybody who's play ma who plays magic will care as much as uh, anybody else. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Draft my cube. That'll, that'll help me out. But yeah, I've got a. Uh, let's see what I. I've got fingered coming out in the next two weeks, um, which will be super cheap and it'll be on Steam only. Uh, I've got Afterbirth coming out in the next two months, um, hopefully before our baby is born. Um, that's my ideal. Congratulations, and, uh, by the way. I didn't know if you were talking about that or a bunch or. Any of that oh, I mean, stuff. I don't talk about it on Twitter because fuck them, you know? Like, right. No, anybody's business. I try to keep the personal stuff to to a minimum on there because a lot of those people just, you know, who cares? But, uh, yeah, I mean, on podcasts and whatever else. It's, no, I mean, it's awesome. I mean, um, my wife and I just had, my son's going to be two in, like, two weeks. And all I can say is, like, I don't know how... You're going to continue to be as prolific, you know, put out the stuff that you put out with a small child. Um, yeah. So you're going to have to, I don't know, start doing amphetamines or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm just not sure. But yeah, well, um, I mean, honestly, we we me and my wife were together for 15 years uh, before we've decided to do this. 16 years actually coming up in October, and um, yeah, this was a very thought out thing, and uh, I'm more than happy to. Uh, have my daughter as my next major project who takes Aww, it you're having a girl that's yeah. awesome that's but cool. i mean there's another thing too like me and me and my wife don't work and in, in quotes you know so i'd like to think that we may have more time than most people to um do our own stuff as well as you know of course the baby's going to take control over everything but yeah just remember, I, I feel like 
I feel like the extra freedom is definitely like I'm glad I'm glad I was able to work for this extra freedom um, because we will utilize it for her as, as much as we possibly can. Just remember, in the dark of the night, those first three months, it gets better. It just always gets, <laughs> it gets better. It gets, and then your your child will pee on you while you're sitting on the couch and make you question things. But uh, but um, one last thing, just because I I'm pretty sure you get this all the time, walking down the street in your home city. Yeah. After birth, okay. I have a suggestion for a trinket. Oh. because I'm a dork. Okay. A a item that you get from fire that works with like a uh, petrified poop or lucky rock that increases oh, the like drop a... rate from fires. From fires? Um and I I like dad zippo is my idea because it's elegant and it fits with the theme but um because there's nothing like that and there there's fires all the way through as opposed to that the poops and the stones that are only in the early game. That is that is not at all a bad suggestion. It's definitely something that is a welcome addition. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it will make it in because yeah. we already closed the book on that. I'm doing a post. Um, I just did a post right before we started this about um, a new item as well as a new enemy. And I think I, I go into detail about how there's uh, 530 items now in the game. So there's a shitload of items. There's going to be stuff that I never see. Yeah. And that's awesome. That's, that's, awesome. that's where I want to be. That's, well, that's amazing. Okay. Well, I do want to thank you for coming on. And um, and everybody draft this cube, even if you're like a cube noob, because noobs give a different, you know, perspective on the cube. And yeah. um, that's it. Um, if you ever want to come back on or anything, let me know. And um, thanks. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.